What is up? You are listening to HVAC Masters of the Hustle podcast. Here's your host, J Dub Moneymaker, and welcome to episode 262. And first time for foremost, I just got to say, I got a great episode, and I believe we all have a Spartan in us. It's my job, my duty, and my obligation to bring that beast out. And I'm super excited because we got a lot of good things coming up in 2024. We're part of some big events. We got a big webinar coming up that we're throwing on February 23rd, next Friday. We got myself, we got Weldon Long, Drew Cameron, Joe Cursera, Joe Cunningham, and Dan Antonelli that's going to be joining us on that. And again, that's next week, three or 12 to 3.30. Super excited. We also have True Grit that's going to be coming up March 5th through the 7th. You could jump up on the uh, website, truegrit.com, enter the code T-G-B-O-G-O to receive buy one, get one free. And then super excited, also piggybacking that event, we got Epic that we're going to be a part of in Anaheim at Disneyland Resort. Super excited to be a part of that. But I am super excited to be with the Godfather today of the Trades of HVAC. Let's go ahead and welcome the one, the only, Mr. King Goodrich. How are you doing, KG? Good. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Man, so first off, I just got to say, you know, you've been on the podcast several times now, and it's an absolute honor to get you on every single time. I've had the opportunity to hang out with you multiple times at the Raider games, which you invited me to. And I just got to say, I just saw you at the big game last week at the Super Bowl in Las Vegas. Talk to me a little bit about that. You celebrating the Super Bowl with your family. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, we kind of got in this routine maybe 10, 12 years ago. I think uh, I think this was number 10 for me of going to the Super Bowl. Uh, You know, first it was. You know, uh, we'd, we'd build it into some of our advertising uh, spend with our vendors. You know, if we hit certain levels, you know, maybe they'd pitch in some tickets and I'd bring my top sales guys and things like that. And then, you know, the last few, you know, we just went, bit the bullet and bought 50 yard tickets. And, you know, I bring the whole family. It's kind of a whole family uh, uh, tradition now. So. I don't know what we're going to do next year going to New Orleans. Not my favorite spot to be hanging out in, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but I got to tell you, well, Super Bowl in Vegas, Super Bowl in the new Raiders Stadium. It you know it, mm. it uh, at, at, with ten Super Bowls under my belt, this by far was the best. The you know Vegas just knows how to handle hospitality and entertainment and. Yeah. You know, they just do it right. So, and that's my hometown, which maybe I'm partial, but man, it was a great, uh, it was a great event. Yeah. I could only imagine the energy that was in that stadium right now. Are you a Raider fan? Cause I know that you got season tickets. I know they're a local team there. I am now. You are now. (laughs) Well, Was it hard to see Kansas City and the 49ers painted in the end zones? Yeah, that was uh, yeah. difficult. Yeah. That was a little difficult one, right? Well, Ken, I just wanted to uh, talk about on this podcast because your level of success is just absolutely, you talk about your one percenters. I mean, you're like the 0.05, right? So I want to talk about, in your life, right? You've had certain defining moments. We see your success on social media, but I want to talk about the defining moments that you might've created that fear factor that I could go this way or that way. And so where was it in your career that you would really say the three biggest defining moments in your career was? Well, I'll tell the first one. That's a little bit of a long story. I'll try to make it as brief as I can. You know, I think, you know, I I really like uh, helping the younger guys who are just getting started from the ground up because I'm a ground up guy. You know, I started as holding the flashlight for my dad, uh, becoming a technician installer. I just worked my way up. And then over the course of time and kind of just my, you know, my drive to, to take myself to the next level, the next level. And where can I go next? Where can I go next? 
I've managed to you know build six very large companies and, and monetize them or sell them over the course of my career. And I've gotten to be involved in all kinds of very different things. And most people are involved in this industry, such as, you know, public companies, private equity companies, uh, large roll ups, acquisitions, things that are kind of commonplace talked about today. But, you know, this I've been doing this since the 80s. And so, you know, and it's just really about me trying to push myself to a higher level of uh, accomplishment and experience. And I think that's, you know, really what's aided me to kind of get to this place I am today. But uh, one of the defining moments was it was back in um, 1988. And uh, I tell this story in my book where, you know, I show up the office one day and I this guy was standing out front and uh, I introduced myself and he said he was from the IRS and he would like to talk about my delinquent payroll taxes. And I was so green. I said, what's payroll taxes? And so, you know, he quickly showed me what payroll taxes were by uh, <laughs> all my money and my trucks and everything else pretty quickly. And, you know, I, I really had to kind of start all over in business. Uh, you know, we didn't shut it down or anything. I just had to go back to me and a couple guys and I'd sell some work. They'd put it in. And I had to dig myself out of this hole. But in that process, you know, I was it was I was overwhelmed and, you know, just not knowing what to do, deciding whether should I even be in business, you know, maybe I should just, you know, go get a job somewhere and maybe it's not for me or maybe, uh, you know, I should try something different because this isn't working. And I was having all these thoughts. So I was driving out. I went out to San Diego <clears throat> to visit some friends, some college friends. And uh, we're driving to dinner one set that Saturday night and I'm falling in my car and I'm thinking about all the stuff, right? All the, everything I'd been through, you know, should I, should I stay? Should I go? Should mm. I punt this business? What should I do? It's, you know, miserable and happy with it and not knowing where my next meal is coming from really. And just, something came over me, overwhelmed me. And I thought, I just said out loud, I'm driving my car. I said, quit being such a pussy and get back there and make that business work. Yeah. I turned off the, uh, the exit on I-5, headed back towards Las Vegas, ended up in uh, Laguna Beach, which is halfway you know, out of San Diego, probably a, another hour and a half or so out of San Diego. And I said, you know, I'm going to stay here for the night. And I just wrote my whole business plan and everything I was going to do. It just was, you know, really got into, I'm taking my life back. I'm taking charge of this business. I'm going to build something great. And, you know, my whole plan was I'm going to build a business that's attractive, that's, that's profitable, has a management team in place that works without me and that I can eventually sell for millions of dollars. That was my really plan. <clears throat> and I don't know what millions of dollars were or what that would mean for me, anything like that. It just sounded good because I'm, you know, 26 years old and I'm figuring it out. Right. Yeah. And then I, and then I, the sun came up uh, and I went out in the balcony in Laguna beach. I'd never been there before. It was a beautiful place. And I'm like, wow. And so I wrote down the last goal I had, I'm going to have a house on the beach in Laguna Beach, California. First time I've ever been there, I saw it. I wrote it as a goal. And, you know, I focused on that. I focused on that plan and uh, absorbed the E-Myth book from Michael Gerber. And I just poured my whole bean into this thing. And I fixed the business. I right-sized it. I started growing it. I acquired two more companies. And then mid-90s, the, uh, the first consolidation craze was going on and I got scooped up and I sold my company. I, I executed the plan that I wrote there in Laguna Beach, you know, five, six years before that and brought my family to Laguna Beach and drove up and uh, there was a nice beach house with a big bow on front of it and said, welcome home, good riches. Nice. Got that done. But I think, you know, I just... You know, you get overwhelmed sometimes. And sometimes you got to shake yourself out of it and say, <clears throat> uh, this is, I'm taking my life back. I'm making decisions. I'm in the driver's seat and I'm going to make this thing work. 
I, I so- like that. I like that you have that mindset, Kim, because a lot of people, I, I think that's a good defining moment because some people don't have that initial push, right? To hold themselves to the highest level possible, to take ownership, right? A lot of people take blame, but you know what? You said, stop being a little bitch. I got to take ownership with what I got to do and I got to make it work. Yep. And I went and I did that. And, and uh, no, go and ahead. Then I, then I kept going. That I kept going. I mean, I got stories after stories. We could talk all day, but, you know, really, you know, what drives me is, like I said, like, okay, how far can I go? You know, how far can I take this learning how to fix air conditioners, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've taken it from, you know, running a service van, installing air conditioners, and everybody understands what that work is like. I've sold a lot of air conditioners as well as a, as a, you know, comfort advisor. Um, and I've taken that craft. And, you know, two years ago, I was standing in front of the top investors in Wall Street in New York City, uh, telling the Gettle story and what I've done with the company, and they all want to invest in the business, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I've, I just kept seeing what can I do next? Where can I go next? What, what, how many more rungs in the ladder can I climb? That's Kim, been my motivation. What do you think gives you the, the opportunity to put yourself in front of the people like wall street? Like what would you say to one of my business owners that are listening right now to put yourself in these different situations that King Goodrich was able to really cal caliper, or network with himself, right? Would you say get yourself uncomfortable? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to get out there and say, you know, you, you got to have these conversations with yourself. Like, I deserve this. I'm worthy of this. And you know, let's just break through this fear and make it commonplace. Mm. I mean, you know, when I first started, obviously I didn't have the same confidence level as I had. And, you know, if, if you're continually trying to measure yourself and your accomplishments and stuff uh, and then breaking through the challenges, uh, that's what builds your confidence, right? Yeah. I got through this. I can get through that. And now I just, I think there's also a level of maturity. Once you get to a certain age, you start getting in your late forties and fifties, you know, you become kind of an adult. I, I always kind of felt like I've turned an adult at 50, but uh, you know, you just have a certain level of wisdom that comes with it over time. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I, like, you know, I started my, I got my contractor's license when I was 21. I got, you know, I sold my first business when I was 30. I, you know, sold my second business when I was 36, you know, and, and just, uh, I, I've put myself out there in challenging situations and forced myself to do the work, to stay on top of it and accomplish the goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, so this is what I tell my team too. You know, once we get past this point, we're never going backwards. You know, our, our minds have reframed. It's like, uh, you know, we've stretched the, we stretched the rubber band. It's never going back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that analogy right there. Uh, KG. Now, one thing that you did just say a couple minutes ago was you wrote down a business plan, right? You focused on your goals and you wrote it down and looked at it, right? Talk about the importance of envision, writing this stuff down, uh, dreaming, dreaming big, right? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really big on that, you know, um, that I've done it my whole career, my whole life, really. I'm pretty good at visualizing what I want to accomplish and, and getting it put down and, and looking at it as a constant reminder. But yeah, that plan, I had it up on my board. I still have it today framed. Yeah, I, but, you know, it was just a one page yellow uh, legal pad that I scribbled all over, you know, and uh, I still have it today. But uh I'd look at every, every day and I, and I wrote this in my book too. Once I understood that a business is a, a, a system, a set of processes, right? Mm -hmm. Checklist, this has to happen, a routine. It happens every single day to deliver the quality service you want your customers to sell the work for a profit. 
um, I went to work on building the systems of the business, right? And but I realized, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a trades guy first, and that's the easiest place for me to get involved in the business, right? Yeah. I hear something that goes on about a job or the field or something like that, and I immediately, you know, that's my go-to. I know it, and I want to talk about it. So I started conditioning myself to get out of that frame because that was not going to get me where I needed to be. It was, you know, it would get me make a living, but it wouldn't make um, it wouldn't make me wealthy. Mm. So I started really practicing drilling, rehearsing on coming in every day with the intent to build a system, build the the processes inside the business, and not be involved in the day to day operation. So I put a mirror up in my office, and a little sign above it said, "said you know, did you." Uh, did you move the business forward today or did you just prolong the agony? Because I, I'm sure a lot of these listeners can understand when you're just showing up every day and you're just shoveling the coal and filling this hole that never fills up and you're just doing the work all the time. It's agony. Right. And I wanted out of that agony. I wanted a, a clean business system ran by a management team that I could you know, oversee and I could be the guy that tweaks the system and makes it better makes it faster, makes it smaller, grows it. And uh, so I would look at that mirror at the, at the end of every day and ask myself, did you work on the business or just prolong the agony? And then I would keep score. And so in the beginning, I was always prolonging the agony. And then, you know, I, I'd get one day where I won. I, I spent all day building the pricing system. Okay, that's a win today. And I started mm -hmm. keeping score. And eventually I got to where... You know, all I did was focus on building the business system. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question, Kim. When I talk to a lot of owners, right, I feel like they're prolonging the agony, right? They're they're not doing what you're saying. Why do you think? Why do you think homeowners prolong it? Why don't you think they work on the business instead of in the business? You mean business owners? Correct, business owners. Yeah. Um. Well, it's just because it's what we know, right? We know how to fix an air conditioner. We know how to sell an air conditioner. We know how to install an air conditioner. Uh, we, we, you know, we also get, you know, hear this talk about dopamine. We always get a little dopamine when we're the, we're the answer guys. Yeah. And, you know, be careful not to be the answer guy in your business, because if you're the answer guy in your business, you are the business and your people will depend on you and they'll never make their own decisions. You need to encourage them to be the answer guys, right? Yes. Now, one thing that you also talked about was implementing, you know, a system, processes, procedures, a system that runs itself. Now, you've been able to, to acquire companies, exit out of companies for some big numbers. Uh, would you say that the, the better systems that you have in place – uh, the better the outcome of that company is going to be? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, what investors want is they want to invest in a business and create a return on their investment, right? They want cash flow. And so the more tight, the tighter your system is, the more, you know, the more metrics and, and data that it's delivering so you can make good decisions and form decisions the better the management team is in place. You have a full suite of man of leaders inside the business handling the key disciplines of the business. Uh, you know, the more predictable the cash flow is, the bigger the cash flow is, and the more valuable the business is. And you know, fortunately, I kind I knew this back when I sold my first business, and that really was my in this little yellow pad uh, business plan was I have to build a team, I have to build the system so that the eventual buyers can see that they can just take my place and reasonably expect the same or better cash flow than I'm receiving. And that's what the, how they value a company. But, uh, you know, all those sorts of things really drive the value. You know, our last transaction uh, with Gettle Air Conditioning, we, we drove one of the highest multiples ever paid in the industry yeah. because you know, because I, I designed it, I built it by design. I knew what investors wanted, right? They want the single brand. They don't want a whole bunch of 
brand names. Mm-hmm. Not a lot, a lot of guys have done it, uh, and it's more difficult. But you know, I put a nice regional regional company together that was all the same brand, all the same marketing, all the same systems, all the same culture. That drove a lot of value. I also knew that making sure that our tech stack, meaning our computer systems and such, and how we run our business is as solid as possible, and that it was it had some unique features that would, uh, again, give the buyer some confidence that, you know, okay, this business will stay together. Uh, and then, you know, we added some other, you know, technologies to the business, such as um, our uh, smart Sadie or smart AC program, where we're now we're uh, uh, installing the HVAC monitoring systems as such in homes. We've got you know, close to 10,000 of those installed already. And then, uh, you know, we, we created a help desk where, you know, we were, technicians are streaming live data back to our help desk. And, you know, we got some more uh, experienced technicians reviewing the data and talking to the technicians through the installation and the call. So all those sorts of things were sizzle on the stake for investor because okay the more robust the system the better the managed leadership team and the use of technology they have greater confidence that that business will stay together grow and you know provide the cash flow that they purchased you got me so uh-huh and so when you when you uh did your acquisition and everything and you're talking about being the one the biggest numbers out there which I know what it is uh, I gotta say congratulations, but what was the negotiation like? Like, did you have that number in mind, or did they come out at that number and you're just like, "Holy shit!" No, like I, you know, I try to manifest everything I do. <laughs> That's important. You know? And I told my guys. So, so what what happened was is uh, so in 2018 we had we had took on a, a smaller PE group partner, and. Our business was a $50 million business at the time in revenue. And so I brought my team together and we we were able to get the capital we needed to take the next step and take some took some chips off the table at the same time. And then we I brought my team together and said, look, you know, this whole consolidation, everything that's going on in the industry, it's not going to last forever. Interest rates are not going to last forever. Time is uh, you know, time is our enemy here. So we need to get a plan so we can execute in no more than three years. And I want to 10x the value of the company in three years. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, most people are like, well, how the heck are we going to do that? I said, okay, look, what we're going to do is we're going to create the thousand day plan. We're going to Put together what are all the key things that we that that we need to put in place in this business to get us from a fifty million dollar valuation to a five hundred million dollar valuation. What are the key elements? What technology do you need? What people do we need? What systems do we need? You know, how many technicians do we need? How many trucks do we need? When do we yeah. need it? What does our sales look like? You know, all the stuff, and we just put this plan together. Now, a lot of it was speculation you know a lot of it was guesswork and we would just continue to look at this plan every week and tweak it and tweak it and make sure that we're massaging it to know where we would go and we worked this plan and we we had have an incredible team of people that really dedicated to this and we drove that business and closed 10 times the value in in 996 days we closed it 996 days in that's incredible that is incredible that's why you're the godfather because but listen man we (laughs) we we, i visualized it i got my team around it i got them excited about my vision they signed up for the vision and you know it's so important that you you get your team pulled together and make them 
make them want to be part and be part of something bigger than themselves. That's when really a lot of magic happens in a team and in a business, right? Oh yeah. And so everyone was excited. Like we were, everyone had on their computer, one of those little clocks counting down a thousand days, you know? Yeah. And we're talking about how many days we have left and how many hours we have left. And uh, I love a, that. that. That's a great a, culture right there. Right. And, and I keep talking about this, right putting things in front of you. Ken's talking about putting uh, clocks on their desk with day countdowns. Like this is the stuff that you got to do. You got to be different than everybody else. And one thing that's different now is the involvement of AI in the industry and the trades and some things that you were talking about with smart AC monitoring. monitoring. So can you kind of go into AI and what your envisions of what the future of the industry looks like? Well, I think that, you know, the AI has already been, it's been used in, it, it's been used in our business for a while now, certainly like the chats and things that go on in the chat bots that go on the, uh, on the website, it's a form of AI, right? Yeah. And so it's been going on for a while. Um, I just, I think now that, uh, you know, we're testing all the AI tools out with Service Titan, you know, like the, uh, their dispatch tool, uh, some other marketing tools, things like that. And we're seeing some real success uh, because it's intuitive and, and how they're going at and taking a look and kind of taking some, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not one that wants to cut head count, you know, uh, right now. Uh, I just, but certainly that it's just another tool and they can, you know, they can use it to make better decisions. How's that? We're also using, you know, as we buy these companies, there's a lot of data inside their CRMs that hasn't been accessed for years and yeah. it's in there. And so now we're learning how to get in there and buy, we're buying these companies and taking their old computer systems that that maybe they weren't on Titan, they were on something else. But there's data inside their old successware instance, for instance, and we're going and mining it and finding customers and opportunities and estimates that you know occurred back in the back in the day and we're tracking those people down and seeing if they still want to do business with us and you know that kind of stuff also searching in databases where our service titan was not set up quite perfectly and being able to extract more da data and, mm. and fill in the customer fields better so that our outbounding team and our and our uh dispatch and technician team have better data on the history to work with. I mean, that's where we're really using utilizing it. I know that some guys are using it for uh, a call by call kind of feature. Hmm. I haven't got there yet because I'm still kind of old school in that. I think uh, I, I really like the human element of that piece mm. of business, right? There's yeah. just so much of that piece of the business that needs to be a human interface and motivation and teamwork that you really can't get from a, com a computer. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's here to stay. Obviously sometimes it scares me, you know, what can be done. Uh, but I'm, you know, we're trying to use it where we can, but I, let me tell it to say this. I see a lot of guys on these Facebook and their groups uh, in HVAC and home service, and they're talking about this and all this stuff they're installing. But I got to tell you, I mean, I've been in hundreds, maybe a thousands of or a thousand uh, HVAC companies over the years. Hmm. I've really made it a point to get to know everybody I can in the industry. When I'm in a city, go visit some shops. You know, I have a lot of meaningful relationships across the country with some of the top contractors where we share ideas and help each other succeed. And, um, you know, what I see is just the fundamentals are so poor in most everybody's shop. You know, they don't even need AI, right? Yeah. Answer the phone better. Yeah. You know, get a script. Yeah. It's the scripts before you put somebody on the phone. Ken, you're preaching it, man. Yeah. You're preaching it. Yeah. I Let me tell, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to take you off course here, though. I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about uh, how I got to the place where I understood the value of my work and what we should be charging in the trades, because I've always been a proponent that, 
you know, we've underpriced ourselves. I think certainly in the last decade, more people have understood the mathematics behind the business and the pricing has come up. And you, this is why you see these guys being so successful now as they more successful they were in the past. These huge EBITDA numbers, numbers that you hear come out of these businesses now because yeah. under, everyone's kind of, they have the technology, understand the math. But, but even back before all that, you know, I was a proponent of being a premium provider, premium, premium price provider and doing the best work possible, right? Uh, you know, if you do the best work, you're going to get paid the most. That's the way I figured. So on my 16th birthday, my dad takes me to get my driver's license. First thing in the morning, 7 a.m. I get my driver's license. I go to school, get out. I'm a, I'm a I don't know, junior or something in high school. And, and uh, I get back the, to the shop after work where his air conditioning shop was. And he gave me three calls. He said, you got your driver's license down. You can you can do the work. Go do these calls. So I'm 16 and I'm doing service calls. So I I was a little afraid to go by myself. So I call my buddy Bob. Plus, it was funner to go with Bob anyway. And, <laughs> and I said, what? I'm going to pick you up. You do these service calls with me. So we drive to the first house. It's springtime, you know, kind of tune up time. And we and in Las Vegas, a lot of units back in the day were up on the roofs because it was swamp cooler conversions to package mm. units. And so we we get up on the roof and I could see right away that the um the the panel off the evaporator side was laying on the ground and the blower wheels had disintegrated. And for those of you older, you know, old school techs that had pillow block bearings and it was all torn up, shaft was torn up. And uh, so I said, hey, Bob, go tell the customer this this unit's too old to repair. Go tell them they need a new one and and we should replace it. Because I was too scared to go down and talk to the customer, right? Mm -hmm. So or shy. Not yeah, shy. So anyway, I go. So Bob says, uh, OK, so he goes down the ladder. He comes back up, says, how much? And I, and I go home. Oh. I didn't contemplate that. I go, $4,200. So this is like 1976, uh -huh. $4,200, right? So he goes down, comes back up, got the check. I go, really? He goes, yeah. So I said, cool. So, you know, go. I said, go tell him that we'll be back tomorrow with a crane and we'll put it up and we'll get it all done tomorrow. Great. Get in the, get in the truck, drive to the next call. Compressor shorted. Bob, go tell him we need a new unit. Uh, it's too old to put a compressor in. Comes back up, brings a check. Got another one installed. So then we go to the third one, and the lady says, "You know, it's an older unit." She says, "When we get there, she goes, it's an old unit, and we put this. Uh, uh, she put this uh, addition on the house. We probably need a new one." So I go up there, I go, Bob, go ahead and tell her that, yep, it's not going to handle this room edition. And he goes, no, you do it. I'm sick of this. You do it. So he makes me go down. I go down and I get my $4,200, right? Trick. So here I'm 16 years old, 1976. Bob and I, you know, we bring in 12 six in one day, which my dad wow. had never seen. And, you know, he's like, you know, I go, hey, dad, well, I sold three units. And he's like, <laughs> where'd you get this price? And I said, well, I, that's what I heard you tell Miss, Mr. Jones last week. He goes, that was for two units. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, do you want, should we give the money back? And he goes, no, they bought because they tr like and trust us and they believe in our value. No, don't yes. give them money. And so right there kind of was my lesson, like, Okay, you know, we're, we, you know, we're going to be the, the best at what we do and we're going to charge a premium price for that and deliver excellent service and our customers will like, and like us and trust us. And price isn't the major consideration in this whole deal. I mean, 16 year olds go grabbing 12 six in, in 1976 proved it. Right. So from that point on, you know, I've never been shy 
to get the right price, to make a good margin and to build a excellent business. Love it, Ken. Uh, as we're ending the podcast, you know, I got a lot of people joining on as we're talking about your struggles and defining moments. There's a lot of people saying that they're in those defining moments and struggles and fears that they're facing right now. And so your story's lifting them up to, to go through those barriers and obstacles and go head on. But before we end, I got listeners from business owners, dispatchers, CSRs, uh, installers, sales professionals. What would you like for them to get out of this episode of HVAC Masters of the Hustle? Well, number one, you know, I start out like most everybody that's probably listened to this podcast. So if I can, you can. It can be done. You just need to apply yourself. And, and you know, the things that I think about are, um, I, you know, I want to do my best in everything we do. You know, our, our ghetto... Uh, slogan is we do things the right way, not the easy way. And so, you know, from the work that we do, from the work I've always done in the field, from the work we've always provided our customers, we've always really worked hard to differentiate ourselves to make it the best that can be done, right? We don't just put systems in the way every other jackass puts systems in. We have a getaway that we put systems in with our own manufactured methodologies our own way, which is the best way. And that's what we sell. And so, you know, always strive to do the best of everything that you, that uh, the work that you're doing. Number two is I have literally read something. I've, I've made myself read something on HVAC, the business of HVAC, the business of plumbing, home services, every single day, day since I started my business in 1986. Every single day, I've made myself read something at least 15 minutes a day on the trade, on the business of the trade or business in general, just to continually sharpen my saw. The next thing I'd say is I put myself out there and I go to the conventions and I meet people and I go to the seminars. And when I go to conventions, I don't go there just to party and, you know, yuck it up with my buddies. I make a plan. I look at okay, here's the speakers. What can I get out of this one? I'm going to come here and I'm going to make this investment of money and time, and especially when you bring your team and we're going to accomplish something when we, when we get done and you make sure you accomplish it. Uh, the next thing I'll tell you is don't, don't be afraid to ask questions and get, and, you know, find some peers. I mean, I literally talked to, I'm sure I talked to a hundred HVAC guys a week that I don't know. A week. They call me, they find me. I'm in this situation, that situation, but I love the business. I love talking about it. I love learning about it. So just be a you know voracious learner. Uh and and you know, just stoke that brain of yours with more power. Um so this, this, this connection that I built all over the industry, I mean, it's taken decades, right? Yeah. But, you know, I don't care. I can go to any city and, and I know somebody in the HVAC business and we're sharing ideas and helping each other succeed. And I guess the last thing I want to tell you, and, I, and I've been really preaching this lately on the Facebook groups is you got to get involved in some in, in the trade associations and the best practice groups. You've got to spend the time doing that. Um, you know, for the air conditioning guys, you know, everybody should be belong to ACA. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, ACA at one time was the big industry powerhouse. Now it has a lot more competition, but ACA wrote the standards and practices for the industry. Like if you want to be great at what you do, you got to know the ACA material. You got to install like ACA says, you've got to use the manual J, the manual D, all the stuff yeah. they created for the industry for the betterment of the industry. And so you need those tools and you got to get involved. And then I would say, you know, the other best practice groups, there's a lot of great best practice groups out there now. Uh, the, the ones that are, um, you know, I, I like the ones that are more, um, you know, textbook, you know, they, they give you the systems, they give you the materials, they give you a coach. There's a lot of, that are evolving now where they are taking a piece of your business. That's not my kind of thing, but uh, certainly the ones where they give you the fundamentals and tools. I mean, 
nobody starts a business with the knowledge of the of the of the work of the business and business at the same time nobody gets that luxury you either know one or the other you know how to run a business but you don't know the trade you know how you know a trade but you don't have to know how to run a business so whichever one you are go get the information on the other side you know everybody especially starting out you know under one million dollar guys two million dollar guys should be in a best practice group they need to know the metrics they don't need to know how they're calculated they need to know how to calculate a price and a gross margin and what it stands for and what's the difference between gross margin and gross profit what is a balance sheet supposed to look like? What what are the ratios to tell you if you're doing good? You know, pricing, like I keep bringing up, is is so important. And nobody, it's still amazing how many people don't even know how to do it or the mathematics behind it. Yeah, yeah, so I hear you. You got to apply yourself and get in these groups. And again, same situation. I, you know, I'm still in several groups and I go to the meetings routinely. Uh, but when I was really, let's say in my younger days, when I was really didn't know the material like I do now, I was, I'd go to seminar, you know, I'd go to a best practice group and they'd have their annual meeting and maybe, so there's 500 people in the room. I'd get there an hour early. I'd sit in the front and center seat. I'd have my notes ready. I'd have my goals set, what I want to learn from that time. And I absorbed it. I went to work. Yes. And that's how I pulled all that information and built all the systems that, you know, we use today. And let me say this, and I know I'm dragging you on a little bit. No, but, you're good. You know, so I bought Gettle Air Conditioning in 2013. I got a, I got a knack years ago for buying companies, figuring out how to buy them and such. And I think it was because, you know, when I was – when I got in trouble in the beginning and I figured out how a business should work and I got out of the hole, I kind of became a turnaround expert. I could walk into any HVAC shop and go, no, do this now, do that now, say that. And, and I could get them out of trouble. And so I, most people didn't want to deal, you know, or encouraged me to not buy Gettle because Gettle was, um, uh, had some really big challenges, you know, it was struggling. It, it, it had some problems and it was, it was, a, it used to be a $34 million business making seven and a half million in profit. Uh, and then when I got to it, it was doing 11 million in sales, losing 3 million a year. Hmm. And my wife, like, why are you doing this? We don't need to make any more money, blah, blah, blah. And the reason why I did it was because, when I was 10 years old and I was holding the flashlight for my dad, the first air conditioner I lit up with that flashlight was a Gettle. And as soon as I did that, my dad said, I'm going to be a Gettle dealer one day because they used to manufacture their own air conditioners. right? Yeah. And so then my dad, as he started his HVAC business, he became a Gettle dealer. So I literally grew up installing, repairing, servicing Gettles my whole career. Um, and um, eventually I owned the company. And so they were, Gettle was really struggling. It was probably, you know, weeks away from bankruptcy. Uh, but I went ahead and bought it. And the first day I walked in and I had this sign made and I said, you know, we are part of the company that invented the residential air conditioner. We are part of the company that has the most patents for HVAC of any company in the industry, 114 patents. Wow. We are part of the company that was the, was the Google of HVAC, if you will, back in the day in the 40s and 50s. Phoenix, Arizona used to be the Silicon Valley of HVAC, and it was because of Gattle. I go, this is who we are. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring this brand back to their rightful place as an industry leader. There's no sense. We're not going to bow our heads and shame anymore. We're not going to act like, you know, we're second class citizens because the business isn't doing good. We are Gettle. And this is what we're going to do. And I put a big sign up on the wall that said, Gettleize the nation. And I got everybody excited about you're part of something great. You're part of a legacy. 
You're part of something bigger than yourselves. You're part of some future. You're going to be part of something one day you can tell your grandkids you helped build that company. And I rallied a team around that thing. And we took that business from 11 million, losing 3 million to a $300 million business in less than five years. Bam, Ken, absolute honor, accomplishment that, you know, many of people, I say dream big, you dream big, but not only did you dream big, you accomplished it, right? And it's an honor to have you in the hot seat, brother. Until next time, God bless y'all. Bam.